this we were starting we thought all of them would be sort of zini books like this right and so this is of course tiny tiny type so it's not like um there were these this one's kind of these made up stories that matthew made up about real french explorers and then based on his descriptions i drew the pictures so there's no there's very little fact. This was based on like three seconds of research on Wikipedia. The, the so books that, in general are yeah. social commentary, critical commentary, but show the third book in this series. So we thought we were going to make these little zany books, but then, so, we, yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. I just want to pause you real quick here because in the future, this is going to be an audio uh, feature. Oh, so uh, uh, thank so you. for thank people you. who are listening to this in um, on the podcast, yeah. Uh, Robbie just held up a book that has uh, probably 20 pages or something like that of mm -hmm. small, you know, sort of a small paragraph and then um, line drawing, colored line drawings of <laughs> imaginary explorer faces, which are hilarious. Yes. And we'll have, a, we'll have a link to some information about that in the show notes. And so to get to your question about the letters, Jessica, because I think that's where we started thinking about whatever our brand is, whatever that means. I would write a letter in a very earnest, straightforward, at times sort of overly scholarly and didactic tone. And then Robbie would go through and make redactions where she would cross out my words and just openly mock me and undermine the points I was making. And it was part of establishing this dynamic where um, we have this interplay, not just between text and image, but between our two personalities. And it, it, I think it, it, it sort of plays out in our collaboration. You talked about how we spend all of our time together. Even before we started making books together, we always worked at the same place. We always, I mean, we have spent 98% of our waking lives together since we met in late 1999. So I guess it just has worked out for us that way, both in terms of light partnership and creative partnership. But the Idiots Books is what it was called, that subscription service. That first year we made 10 books. At the end of that year, we were having a great time. We were not making money, but we weren't losing it. And my boss from the corporate job called me back and asked if I would be willing to come back half time from home. And the half time from home arrangement gave me enough time to write the books. And Robbie, whose part just takes longer than mine, the illustration part takes longer, um, did the art. And um, we had the predictable income we needed to comfortably start having kids and uh, you know keep on going as functioning adults in the world while making our creative work. So that was the really wonderful thing that happened. And I still have that job. I mean, that's sort of the secret that not everybody knows, but 17 years mm -hmm. after I started that job, I still work half time. I pivot 90 degrees and over here's another computer and I'm a con communications consultant, strategist uh, and writer who makes college recruitment materials. That's my that day job. very fancy, Matthew. So that's, that's but no, that. but that's, that's what has enabled us to keep pushing forward in creativity and keep having children and keep, you know, we don't suffer. We live a perfectly comfortable life while being full-time creatives. And I just have this other thing on top of it that pays the bills. So to answer that, that, is that question. Really, yeah, I and mean, that is great. I'm really glad you said that because I think that the, um, you know, I, I'm sure that your um, solo creative in endeavors now provide a lot larger proportion of your income than they used to mm -hmm. and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that idea of having just kind of one thread of stable income, part-time, flexible, from home, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things, mm -hmm. something I talk to my students about all the time when they're thinking about their future. And I say, you know, it, the dream could be certainly to quit your day job, for real quit your day job and walk away from it. But there are also arguments for, you know, maintaining that thread and just having kind of stability there. And it's, it's, you know, what's coming, you don't, you're not responsible for all the pieces the way you are with your, your own business. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you only do the one piece. Mm -hmm. And it has, I mean, it also gives you creative freedom to, um, you know, we never had to worry about if the books were going to make money. We made some of the weirdest little strange little books and none, I mean, none of them made money but we loved doing it and we wouldn't have been able to afford to do it without having Matthew's job. Um, and it just worked out, you know, I, it, not just the illustration takes a long time, but I also do all the design and like lay, lay out all the, like all the extra, like there's a lot of extra work that goes into it. That was just that I couldn't do if I had a full-time job either, or but even, you you gained yeah. the skills in graphic right. design, page right. layout, doing 
two years of a graphic designer for right. the same firm that I work for now. So yeah. it's it's amazing how reinforcing our professional experience is with our self-publishing and now professional publishing experience. We couldn't have done one without the other. Yeah, I mean, another important thing to note is that we were professionals for 10 years before we started doing this. So it's a lot of times we do a lot of talks at colleges and um, a lot of times student, students will ask us, well, how do I, how do I, you know, how do I get to where you are as quickly as possible? And we're just like, there's no, there's no quickly about it. Like it's putting in a lot of time in a lot of places. And, and it's also luck, like things have to break your way um, again and again and again in order to make it all happen. So yeah. So Although, did, I mean, do you feel like the, some of the choices you've made, you've created your own luck? Because I feel like yeah. that's what happens is like when yeah. you, it's, it's not really luck when you've been putting in 10 years of, you know, right. work, learning your skills, right. right? you know. Yeah. I mean, we have this story of uh, the, our sort of first breakthrough into commercial publishing was that we were at, were we at MoCA or SPX, Matthew? That was at MoCA. Yeah. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. had, we set up a table at MoCA and a guy from Disney. Oh, that's there it. Is. There I you go. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So a guy from Disney came by our table and bought 10,000 stories. And now at the time, I, we didn't, I don't remember him. We didn't talk to him. There was no, like, it, he just did that. And then he held on to it for like two years. And then he was at a production meeting at Little Brown and they were doing, so 10,000 stories is a mix and match book. So it's divided into three pages for the people who can see. It's divided into three uh, sections for, oh, four sections for each page. And then they swip and swap and you can mix up the words and you can mix up the pictures and they recombine in 10,000. So you have 10,000 different possibilities. And so um, so Little Brown was making a mix and match book in the Superhero Squad series, which is Marvel. And that's why this Disney guy was there. And he said, oh, I met some people who know how to do this. Um, and that's how we got our foot in the door. And that was extremely lucky, right? The guy happened to pick it up. Look, look at this. She's, she's, she's got it. Yes, yes. Well, but you know what? Before that even happened, we did this book yeah. called The Superhero Squad Flips Out, which had our names on the back in four point type yeah. because we were not the point. Robbie was not allowed to actually draw any of the characters. She was given a bank of clip art and was asked to sort of build these compositions using the clip art. I was given top secret dossier of the Marvel superhero kid versions from which to write these stories. So not our creative content. We did as much as we could to be creative and inventive within these very tight confines. It turned into a book that nobody read and wanted to give us any credit for, but it turned into a great relationship with this editor who said, I like these two, they've got good ideas. Let's make a book together. So that then turned into our first actual self-published, not self-published, commercially published book with, with a publishing company. But yeah. Right. Yeah, so to the, again, to explain uh, the visuals we're talking about here, sure, uh, 10,000 sure. Stories, the original 10,000 Stories is a self-published uh, spiral bound book with strips in it that that flip back and forth in order to form different stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the superhero version is the same thing, but with superheroes. And then mm -hmm. 10,000 Stories was then published as a, you know, commercially published version by Chronicle Books, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. So, and this is actually, this book is actually in some ways why we became better friends, I think, because Matt, Matt Madden, my husband, is really interested in constraints and mm -hmm, Ubapo, mm -hmm. Ulipo, you know, yeah. this, uh, these literary movements that have to do with uh, rules and, and, and playing games with, with comics and with uh, prose. And this is a classic example of an Ulipian kind of structure. So, you know, it's like the, the work, and I think this is what you're saying about the editor is like, the, it's by making things and putting things out and by doing the legwork and willing, being willing to do it yourself, that you start to make um, connections and to uh, bond with other people, both people who are going to help you in your professional career as far as like, you know, editors and so on. But like, you know, the reason we're doing this right now is because I'm friends with you because, right. Right. you know, of this kind of thing. So right. it's like the work makes those links possible. So, so in terms, so in terms of what you were saying about making luck, I think this one anecdote has about five different examples of making luck. First of all, we relentlessly and doggedly made books, right? We self-published 45 books with Idiot's Books. And this one book that we made happened to find its way into this one guy's hand. 
And that turned into this opportunity. But we had to make all the books to know which one that would do. Okay, so sort of dogged relentlessness, which can only happen if you love it enough to do it for its own sake. It's also a matter of showing up and representing yourself, right? We were at the table at MoCA. Sometimes we see people at MoCA with beautiful work who kind of shrink back and don't project that they want to share it with you. Um, Robbie and I both being behind the table together helps a lot, but we try to get out there and say, yeah, go ahead, Robbie. I was just going to say, if you're ever behind a table trying to hawk your wares, bring along a friend <laughs> and it makes all the difference. It's very awkward to sit. Whenever like Matthew has to go to the bathroom and I have to stand behind there by myself, the sales like tank. So if you're- <laughs> And vice versa, yeah. Yes, so you just have to stand there and be attentive without being oppressive and be engaging. And sometimes that just means engaging with your table partner, um, which that's just like an insider tip for selling it at those shows. I think it helps a lot to have somebody with you. Yeah, well, go if ahead. anybody is doing those things, I would say go visit, if you guys still have a table, go see your table. It's always mm. looked beautiful. You know, you always had these great racks of stuff and it was just very engaging. And yeah, I mean, standing up and like making eye contact right. and all those kinds of things. It's not easy. It's not easy to do. But I wanted to get back to something sure. you were saying earlier, um, Matthew, about the idea of building out your brand, starting with those letters, starting with your presentation of the Idiot's Books. Um, and I want to just ask you, because I mean, this is one of the big questions I think people have about how do you figure out something to align with, a way to be sort of consistent. And you guys have such a consistent brand. Like it's you, it's so um, it's so you and it's so authentic and it's so uh, energetic. Like you, it's like goofy, you know, <laughs> and then there's this transparency to it. So like, how did that evolve for you? Were there moments when you were really struggling to figure that out or did it happen naturally or? I think, I go ahead. I think it happened sort of naturally, uh, but we did, we have narrowed it down because the times that we have tried to, when somebody says, oh, you really should do a book about this, or you really should try doing this, whenever we try to do that, it doesn't work. Um, and it's usually, it's very clearly unsuccessful in whatever metrics that we use to measure these things. So- What we, metrics do you use to measure these things? We, I mean, whether, Honestly, whether we feel good about it, I think, whether we think that we've created something that's that's that we like. Um, and so I think uh, a lot of times we just um, have tried to do other things and it hasn't worked. So we've stopped trying to do it the way other people tell us to do it. And that has helped a lot. I don't know. What do you think, Matthew? Well, in terms of brand, I think the reason that our brand, if that's the right word for it, even is consistent is because it's so rooted in who we are. We're not trying to make anything that we're not. We have a very natural rapport that it's helped so much to have the two of us. If yeah. either of the one of us had to do some of the ridiculous things we do on our own, it would be very, for me, uncomfortable. But the fact that I have this dynamic with this other person with whom I have 98% genetic similarity in terms of what we believe and value and love to do but those 2% of friction. Wait, 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 wait. 98% genetic similarity. I'm talking about like- Creative in terms genetics. Of creative genetics, yeah. <laughs> okay, creative just personality. checking. No, no. We're also brother and sister. Aren't no, we 90, I'm kidding. Look, I think we're 94% genetically compatible with goldfish, right? So I think actually I'm under- Okay, well, yeah, all right. But, 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 but no, I guess what I mean is, Robbie and I have shared values, we have shared aesthetics, we have shared insistence on quality, we have shared insistence on treating people well, like the things that we value that hold the brand together, we share. The things that we are different in, in terms of personality type, our approach to process, just our general like affect, there's enough contradiction that there's sparks. So I can be wholly Matthew, I can play the role of Matthew wholeheartedly knowing that Robbie will temper and check me. I can be way too earnest and Robbie can w be way too the opposite of earnest. When you put us together, we balance each other out. And that happens in life too. Like if our brand is, Matthew is the hard charging, wants to get stuff done super efficiently. And Robbie is that I would never get out of bed if Robbie Matthew didn't give me a reason to in the morning. Um, like in the middle of that, Robbie keeps me from spontaneously combusting and I keep her from a life of- Unconscious all the time. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, so we, we create a space where we keep each other sort of balanced in that respect. 
we also keep each other balanced in terms of sort of mood and temperament. If one of us is having a bad day, the other one will just by default have a buoyant, joyous day. Like we, we balance each other out and we pull each other up. So there's a real symbiosis going on that I don't think we contrived. I think just is, and we've refined over the years. But in terms of how it affects our work, um, I, I, th I think we're very fortunate that even though we are now making work for other people, for the other people to make money, right? It's now in a business environment, not just in this pure creative environment, we're still making work that we both love. And I think the, the, the insistent through line throughout all of this, it's only making stuff that we really feel aligned with in terms of values and creative principles. So, so one of the through lines of our work is that it's funny. One work, one, one is that it's very sort of word oriented. I think, you know, we really like, we care about the quality of language, that the language and the words always have a very dynamic relationship. Robbie is never just illustrating what I'm writing, but she's always sort of a co-author in terms of shaping and determining content. So I think very early on through our self-published stuff, we set up some creative values that we have not veered from. And I think if you're very deliberate and purposeful upfront about what you will and will not create and you stick to it, then you're more likely at the end where it starts to become more of a business or a profession or a money jittering mechanism for you and others to still be doing what you love. And I'm right. really I fortunate th that we do. I think one of the benefits of having done self-publishing for 10 years is that we were able to figure out what it is that we cared about and what it is that we would and would not do before other people were counting on us to make money for them, right? In including so, working together. If yeah. We tried at the outset with no body of work beneath our feet, no connections to say, we will only work together, publishers. People would have laughed at us. That's not the yeah. way this works. Yeah. yeah. But now we um, work together. Yeah, go ahead, Robbie or Jessica. Yeah. I was just um, wondering. So obviously, you guys have a really strong relationship, strong marriage. You know, you love to be around each other. You have to, and and you look very happy. So that's all wonderful. <laughs> but I wondered if you can also, because there, I get this question a lot from people mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. working with partners, working with um, you know romantic partners of various kinds, mm -hmm. but also non-romantic partners, just partners. Um, what are some of the things you guys have run into and had to resolve? Oh. as far as working together. We have one big sort of existential difference that has raised its head over and over and over again. Repeatedly, it's like it comes on a cycle um, that uh, we work very in opposite ways. Matthew is somebody who gets a job done two weeks early, has time to revise, think about it, uh, do all, you know, whatever. He's always done, He's anytime there's a, an event to be at, he's there five minutes early and is wondering why nobody else is ready. So I'm somebody who will arrive exactly five minutes late, but I'll, you know, I make my deadlines, but the, the two weeks preceding the deadline are a complete nightmare for everyone in the family because I am just working 24 seven. Matthew's trying to juggle the whole rest of the family. There's no like, I can't be bothered. I have to, the way that I work is I have to drop into a hole and if I'm, distracted or if I, if people are coming in asking me stuff, I can't get my work done. So generally speaking, like our oppositional, Matthew's like, why can't you just start when we have two months notice, start doing like three pages a day and then you'll be done a week early. And somehow I can't manage to work that way. And so that has been, uh, that because, because yeah. we're married, it's especially difficult because he's the one who has to take up all the slack, right? When I'm in that mode, if we were, um, if we were not married um, and I was doing this for a job, I suspect it would be less maddening. It would be not maddening at all. The yeah. work is always superlative and it's on time. <laughs> if I didn't have to watch it get made, it would be delightful. <laughs> so. Uh, no. And, and, and really, honestly, this is, yeah, I think this is just different approaches. And I think it's just part of the deal. I mean, we, we go about our creative work differently. It's frustrating sometimes when situations like Robbie describes come to pass. Was that, oh, oh, is that our family? Okay. Yeah, that's our family. Oh, oh. okay. Um, we, we have a lot of families in play here. <laughs> yeah. We've got three and kids and a puppy in our room. Do you want Hang to on one second here. No, we'll just talk yeah, to I'm just people gonna, for a minute. Yeah. Just, just talk, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> we don't need you. Get out of here. 
Um, so we, um, it's, it's uh, I, I, in terms of the creative product, the creative product always turns out great. In terms right. of the process of getting there, uh-huh. it is sometimes bumpy, but it's part of what we do. And honestly, part of what I've had to do over the years is just sort of adjust my expectations, which is a good lesson for any part of life that's frustrating, right? So we get where we need to go. And, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. it's also been a um, sort of a creative conundrum for me because I have been to, and this, I, I say this for the people who are last minute, um, people who would be good putting out a fire, right? Mm-hmm. There's some of us who work uh, best under crisis and I don't, like to work under crisis, but I can effing take care of business when things are going down. So I'm, I, for a long, for my entire life, I was told, uh, you should wake up early and get your work done early and, uh, get it done before you go to work and not procrastinate and don't put things off and all of this stuff. And I tried, I have tried so many times and I've tried so hard to do it in what I thought was the right way. It's not the right way for me. I don't do good work. I don't do as good work when I'm just sort of very slowly and deliberately working. I do my best work when I'm like dropped in a hole and I'm in a frenzy and that's all that I'm thinking about and that's all that I'm doing. And I've had to, um, I've so, you know, I spent a lot of time defending myself to Matthew um, creatively, but at the same time beating myself up because I've felt like I should just learn how to do it the right way. And it's only been in the last few years where I finally said, and it's because Matthew has also finally said, look, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop trying to make you do it the way that I want it to be done. And I've stopped saying it may be the right way for everyone else, but it's just not the right way for me. And I can try really hard and spend a lot of energy trying to do it that way. But we're just going to have to suck it up and have a sucky end. <laughs> like the, and here's the, thing, the, the characteristics of Robbie that make you approach your illustrative work that way, uh, solve problems and other aspects of our life and relationship, your incredible focus, your incredible ability to lock in on a problem and spend a long time diving deep into it. That's not the way my brain works at all. So Robbie's able to code our website, do our taxes, um, another very formative part of Robbie's being in character that's also kind of about our business model is that every summer since she was 18 months old, Robbie has gone with her family to the far reaches of the Alaskan tundra and been part of a commercial salmon fishing operation. And commercial salmon fishing happens when the salmon say it happens. So you often will have to stay up wearing wet rubber pants for three or four days straight, pulling sockeye salmon out of the Bering Sea with your bare hands, not sleeping, not eating. I think that is where Robbie's soul was forged. And that is why she works the way she works. And that is the delight of Robbie. And that is why I don't recommend marrying Robbie because now I have to go do that. So when 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 I need to go to sleep, I look at Robbie and I'm gonna go to sleep, you keep fishing. And you know, there are times when I simply give up. I, I expend all of my energy in great spurts. I get my work done, er, work done early, but then I am done. I am done. I do not have stamina. I do not have longevity. We work differently, but because of the different ways we work, we get to cover all the bases. If we were more similar, we would not be able to do the, the extent of things we do because we, we have very different skill sets. So we have figured out in the universe of who we are over the past 20 some years, who should do what thing. And we, we stick with that. I am the one that gets up in the morning and feeds the kids breakfast and does the morning shift. Robbie does the night shift because I turn into a pumpkin at eight o'clock. If there are crises in the middle of the night, Robbie deals with those. I mean, we each have our thing that we do in our business and our life and our creative work. It's, it's usually fun. There are moments where it's like, ah, but we live with those because the end result is awesome. Yeah, I hear you. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I love it. Uh, yeah, no, that's so great. And I recognize a lot of that. I mean, Matt and I have collaborated on a lot of projects yeah. as well. And we also have complementary skill sets. And maybe that's kind of the key, the takeaway for this for other people is is don't look for people who are similar to you and learn to accept those differences and look for the strengths in those differences. I think um, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned after coaching, what, like 700 people or something in the Creative Focus Workshop is that yeah. everybody's different. Everybody yeah. works differently and every method for working that functions uh, 
is fine. <laughs> and, right. and beating yourself up is the one thing that yeah. will stop you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's uh, shift gears slightly here. I, sure. I did have one last question about um, self-publishing, going from self-publishing to commercial publishing. Yeah. Um, and that is um, a little bit, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit of your reflection on the difference between the two and uh, advantages and disadvantages for you, given that you did set up such a strong uh, vision and um, body of work before you started working with publishers so that, that you came into it, you know, as equals essentially, mm -hmm. which not everybody does. Mm -hmm. But how does that, how does that play out for you now? You want to go first Rob or me? Um, you know, I think there's benefits, uh, Commercial publishing is great because you actually have a team of people who do the things that you are not really good at. Um, as much as we had a consistent brand and we showed up and all of those things, we were never, um, you know, it's funny. In self-publishing, like the greatest success maybe is, uh, I think I heard you say this, Jess, uh, getting getting published by Fantagraphics, right? That's like, that's like, you know, we would go to SPX and be like, oh, like maybe we'll submit our work and get like a, a what is it, Einstein? No, Ignatz, what is it? Harvey, Ignatz, Einstein, Ignatz, Harvey. Ignatz, whatever. I didn't know you had these dreams, Robbie. Well, I remember <laughs> once we submitted to Ignatz and we were like, maybe this this will be the key to what, I don't know what we thought we were, what was yeah. gonna happen. But like the peak, um, that's a key insight there. I don't know what we think was gonna, what we thought was gonna happen, <laughs> right? Like really peak insight. like. We never had a plan beyond we want to make stuff together. Yeah. So we started the subscription service because we wanted to force ourselves to make stuff together. We shifted from Idiot's Books to Bobbly Books, which was our children's self-publishing wing, because somebody told us that we might be able to sell more copies because there's a better market for children's books. We bought a night. Did that work? No, no, <laughs> no, because because those were more expensive for us to produce. So we made even less money. We purchased a this night. Is, this is one of our fa family's favorites right here. Excellent. Yay. Yes. Girl with frogs in her ears. It's an excellent one. I recommend it to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I always feel like I have frogs in my ears when I'm wearing this. <laughs> like little, you know, wireless earphones. We we started a letterpress um, for, uh, company for a while. We bought a 1921 Chandler and Price, like weighed three tons and had to put it in our house. We tried that for, we've tried all these different things. We've iterated with creativity. The core of it has always been doing stuff together. And so now we have ended up in this place where we're publishing books with Macmillan and Random House. And they are books that we never would have, first of all, thought to make and never could have pitched without the, the runway we built, sort of a brick at a time, by just sort of following the scent of creative opportunity, right? Well, yeah. Let me just say, to, to answer your question, Jessica, the, um, so the books that we are working on now are middle grade, um, densely illustrated sort of cross, they're not graphic novels, but they have lots and lots of pictures on it. They're called hybrid, right? They're That's, called hybrid yeah. books. And they're, you know, how many, 360 pages or something, right? So that is something that we could never have self-published. Like our self-publishing mode was like literally printing stuff up on our printer and stapling it together on our living room table and trimming it down. Like that was how we were self-publishing. So um, it literally would have been impossible for us to make that kind of book as self-publishers. Um, so that's one benefit. Yeah. So that's a creative benefit. Um, the other thing is that now we are spending most of our time on the creative side of things instead of on like, traveling to shows and, you know. Or just filling 500 envelopes right. and making Which, 500 self-published books. Yeah. There was a real thrill to that for a while, but I eventually got tired of how much manpower was going into folding and sealing envelopes <laughs> and doing labels and, isn't this why you had children though? Isn't this the point? <laughs> they're not useful they're, yet. They're only now starting to get useful. I filled uh, an order for books yesterday and I made Alden like, Alden's raring to like have a job. She's 12. And so I had her helping me fill the orders and I was like, and I just was like, go get the tape. And she got the tape. I was like, this is what it's about. Now <laughs> I see we just started self-publishing too early. I want to give a shout out to, you mentioned this briefly, Robbie, but the, the real benefit for me of moving into the commercial publishing world is yes. getting to work with editors. 
Robbie was an incredible editor for the 10 years we worked together. I could never have made my books without her. She gave me the feedback and sounding board I needed, but professional book editors. I have learned so much from both of the people that I've worked with, first at Macmillan and now at Random House, who just taught me how to build stories and how to weave together narratives and how to just think about writing in a way that maybe I would have learned if graduate school had had me, but now I'm getting a chance to learn. So my own writing ability has taken off exponentially. And being part of publishing houses means there's a publicist who's out there getting us opportunities to be in front of people, who's getting us a profile in the Washington Post, who's getting us to do a blog post and we need diverse books, you know, things like that, that either we couldn't have lined up ourselves or it would have been a lot harder for us to line up ourselves. So we have the benefit of these really smart art directors and publicists and people who think about covers and things that just make our creative product better and bigger than it could have been before. Yeah. That said, that yeah. said, yeah. Um, one of the non benefits with working with other people is that you have to make compromises, right? So uh, the great thing about self publishing is no matter how weird our idea was or how silly it seemed or how little money it was going to make, we could do it. We just did it. We would just do it. So there was a lot of freedom. I'm still like, I'm still very wistful of our self-publishing days. We just don't have time to self-publish anymore because we're so consumed with all this other stuff. But we keep saying like someday <laughs> we'll get back to making our weirdo little books that nobody buys. <laughs> well, the kids are getting older. So, you know, yes, soon, that's right. soon you'll that's have right. an entire team. Right. <laughs> um, we started over and now we have a three-year-old, Jessica. Yeah. I don't know. We, 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 we just really <laughs> messed that all up. But you know, I, I do believe there's a time in a place for us to get back into self-publishing. And right now yeah. there's just so many plates in the air that. Yeah. I, w I wanted to ask you too, because, and I'm going to touch on the salmon thing in a minute. Cause that's sure. just like so left field. I love it. Um, <laughs> But the, um, I wonder, uh, Robbie, your mom was a ceramicist and yeah. had a shop. And then I believe it was your parents who, I don't know why, and I'd love to learn why, decided that going to Alaska and doing commercial salmon fishing would be a great idea, right? Yeah. Um, so they're entrepreneurial, right? Yes. Your, your parents are, uh, let's just do this thing kind of people. Yes. Um, yes. And I'm, you know guessing, Matthew, that your parents are maybe not quite those people. <laughs> I mean, my parents are amazing they're, people. They're they, clearly amazing. And they're like, right. you know, I see them in your family photos in Alaska. Yeah. It's not like they're not game, but mm -hmm. I imagine you didn't get this from them. Because There is a you know. different version of my life where I never left the, the company that I worked for. And I have just a very much more predictable sort of orderly existence, but I don't get all of this other stuff. So marrying Robbie, as I warn you all against, means <laughs> marrying this, this culture of sort of fearless entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship that it's just transformed my life in the most delightful ways. So Robbie has given me permission to take risks that aren't actually risks, right? I think so often the things that feel risky might actually not be quite as scary as we think they are if we look around and and see what what's the worst that can happen. The answer is not always as bad as we think. And there was there have been a couple of times when we have really jumped off the expected path, and it's worked out for us because we were able to go into it with such conviction because of Robbie's belief in herself and in the, the spirit of adventure. So yeah, and that's definitely the legacy of her parents. What was the biggest mistake you made jumping off the path, and what did, what happened as a result? Maybe something that looked like a mistake and then wasn't, but like for a moment you're like, oh, that was not good. <laughs> I mean, I think this was an accident of Matthew not getting into graduate school. Like we really had sort of figured out, at the time we had felt we had figured out our plan, which was a life of being in academia and creative work sort of as part of like Matthew would maybe teach, be a creative writing professor and I would be a art professor. Um, so that was, that was the plan. Yeah, we had a story of what our perfect creative lives could be. And the story right. was, I get my MFA, Robbie has her MFA, we're professors, we publish, we do freelance. Like it was a really awesome story. It, we would have been so excited if that story had happened. That story was denied us. And so we had to author a different story. So I guess 
there's two ways to go about it. You can have power of conviction behind a story and try everything you can to make that version of the story come true. Or you can pick a thread and follow the thread and let the thread itself be the driving force and see what story materializes. So this is a retrospect that I'm giving that advice to myself. Right. Right. That's how it turned out. But for us, if we had stuck to the original story, we might never have gotten it. And we certainly wouldn't have stumbled on this one. So the biggest mistake I think that I made or that we made along the way is when we first had the opportunity to work oh, with yeah. an agent, somebody wanted to work with us. We were like, yes, there were red flags from the start that it wasn't a good match, but we were so excited at the idea that this was our entree into this new world that we didn't really investigate fully enough. And we just made a bad match that that was difficult and unproductive. And when we finally sort of moved on to a new agent who was the perfect match, who was introduced to us by someone who knew us deeply, our, our editor at, um, at Chronicle, we said, so, you know, who are some agents who you think we'd really sync with? She told us, and that's been blissful. So I guess if I had given myself advice, like value yourself, not to leap at the first possibility, but really make sure that whoever you align yourself with has the shared sort of vision priorities, et cetera. So that, but you know, that it's hard for me That's to- That's an impossible lesson to I know, learn I know. too, right? When you're just starting right? out. Yeah. yeah. And what were we going to do to tell this person, no, we don't want you right. to represent us. Right. What we could have done is do a little bit of homework and see if there was anybody else who would represent us. But we were sort of like, oh, this I was, person- I was so excited. Yeah. 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 Because it seems I mean, like it's extremely exciting, but I think that that is, it is actually something that it is a moment when you have to, you know, when you're going to be committing to a relationship and there's going to be real skin in the game one way yeah. or another. Yeah. Uh, there are times when you have to say no. Yeah. yeah. Even though it feels really painful and scary. And I think yeah. trusting your gut on that and saying like, at least let's, you know, put the brakes on this, slow down, mm -hmm. see what's going on seems like that's a learnable lesson, you know? <laughs> I think yeah. the lesson I would give to the old me is talk to some other people about it. Reach out yeah. to other people who you know who can give you advice. We were just like, yes, let's do it. And at the time, we honestly didn't even really know what an agent did or yeah. how they could be useful other than like signing contracts, which we were like, okay, well, we're glad that somebody else will do that. But obviously it's a much more complicated relationship and job than that. So yeah, that was, that was a mistake. But other than that, I, I, yeah. I feel like I can't think of too many things that feel like real. T we, we've had things that didn't work out, like the letter. I don't think you guys. Press. Yeah. I mean, I think that the way you run your life, there almost aren't. It can't be mistakes, you know, <laughs> that's because you just you're like, OK, next thing. You know, right. that's just yeah. right. that that didn't go as expected. And so, right. all right, that's information. And I think that's, of course, the best way to look at mistakes is, you know, that was interesting. Let's keep moving. I'll tell you about a mistake we're about to make. I know that this experience is gonna kill me, but we have purchased a 24 foot school bus that we are converting into a tiny home that we and the four kids and the puppy are going to live in for a year while we travel and visit high poverty schools in all 50 states, give away 50,000 free books and sort of blog and video cast the entire thing. Um, so that is our, that is our, our our next great we're fun we're fundraising for this right now and we were going to leave in september but then the pandemic happened so it's been delayed at least a year but that is that is sort of taking what we do and what we are i mean it's definitely for the kids that we're going to visit on the road but it's also a project to draw attention to educational inequity in the power of creativity and specifically books to energize kids to create a ripple effect, to um, to make good things happen after we're on the road to the next stop. So the way I am wired, it's going to actually probably physically end my existence. But hopefully Robbie will be able to pick me up. I won't have a, a room to go decompress in after dinner. But I, it's, the adventure sounds too too much. We'll different. bring a little pup so, tent for you. We can throw right. the pup tent out, and you can just lie there quietly by yourself. I'm picturing one of those like pop up things on the roof. You know? Yes, we oh, will we have, have that. Yeah, yeah, we have to. There's too many children too many to children. actually sleep in the bus. So yeah. yes. So anyway, we'll see. How uh, that goes. So that yeah that that brings me to my um, basically final topic, which is extreme partnering to extreme parenting. So uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, working at home. Mm -hmm. uh, with kids at home, are your kids in conventional school normally? Yes. Oh, no. yes. Yes. 
not yeah, right now, the, obviously, because they go to the local public schools but... that Robbie went to. So it's, it's really cool. It's the very cool. school yeah. that I went to mm -hmm. as a kid. Mm -hmm. Some of their teachers were even the same teachers. <laughs> wow. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. It is no, cool. it is. But so on, in normal years, they're out of your hair for a while, in other words, yes. and you have yes. you know work time at home. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I was just, you know, then you're thinking about like riding a bus for a year. That's obviously going to be a homeschool year. Or, yes. or a no school year. It might yeah. just be. An unschool this, year, but, yeah, you know, a, yeah, a not right. going to school year exactly. in any case. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And yeah. Um, ultimately, like, I got to say, our kids are, except for the fourth one, are very sensible and adaptable. I think in part because every summer, you know, literally we take 24 hours to get up to Alaska you know, via all these planes, we're sleeping in, we're sleeping in airports, we're, you know, we get up there, there's no, they sort of, they have learned to roll with it, whatever it may be. And for kids, that. Kids are capable of more than we realize. The first summer I went to Alaska with Robbie, the neighbor's daughter, who was two and lived a quarter of a mile away through a whole sort of alder forest in which bears occasionally wandered, would walk through the alder forest to our house stop at our door, take off her boots, knock, have a snack, eat the snack and go home. And that, you know, and she would take her coat off and she'd do all the buttons. Or I mean, kids can do more than we realize. And so our kids are not quite that free range, but they're they're further. And we, we, we give them a lot of autonomy in part because it's helpful and in part because they rise to the occasion. So they do a lot of taking care of each other, of taking care of themselves of entertaining themselves. Um, and thank goodness that they are capable of that. So yeah, except for that third one, well, our fourth one. Yeah, but we're, we're working on him. We're working on him. <laughs> was this a phase that they all went through at that age? No, or no. Was this special? one, is, this this one, one trouble. was born trouble. Yeah. Yep. He's, <laughs> he's, we, a lot, he's a lot like Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, if I hadn't had the previous three, who are perfectly well-behaved and good kids, I would be like, man, I am like the worst parent ever. This kid is the worst. He's, he's the, you know, he's the kid where when you're out in the grocery store, there's other people like, why won't that one? And I'm always like, no, no, I have three other children. They're very good. It's just this one. I think so. he's good. He's gonna do. He's gonna do great things in the world. We have to make sure he harnesses his power. Yes, for yes, yes. But, um, he will. But he we, will. we do. We do a lot of tag team parenting, Jessica, because we each need our time to do our work. So I'm sure you and Matt are familiar with this too. You have to divide and conquer, and um, we get through it. And the kids, the kids think what we do is cool, so they're excited that we do that it. They understand that it means we can't always be there. Um, all six of us together as much as we'd like to, but I mean, there's yeah. also the benefit, and this is a benefit I had growing up that in the summer, when we go to Alaska for that five weeks, that is, we're all together. We're doing like, that's something where we're actually, I'm working all the time up there too. What am I talking about? But it well, feels we, like, it feels like we're not constantly being like, go in the other room. Like I have to get this done. Um, it, it feels like we have a very strong, like thing that we all do together. And to answer your yeah. question, Robbie's dad started the Alaska adventure specifically and purposefully to create an experience for the family to do together every year. And until this past summer, the entire family came back for 40 consecutive years. You know, it is um, this real multi-generational focus on people. The fishing itself is a thing that we do for the sake of the community it creates and not the other way around. The fishing is not a reliable. Yeah, that's system. clear. I mean, it's yeah. from the way you write about it, it's clear that that really is what it's about. It sounds totally magical and awesome. Also super scary. Like, you know, it's just, the <laughs> it's, it's undescribably unpleasant. And yet, <laughs> and yet it's magical. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And I, I mean, I love the idea of, you know, my kids are not as free range as yours are, but they're a lot more free range than a lot of other kids are, because I really believe, as you say, the kids are capable of a lot more than we think. But, you know, they've almost literally been inside the house, you know, yeah. for a year now, a year. Yeah. you know, my yeah. son basically refuses to leave whenever we ask him to leave the house. You know, we yeah. don't have any out, you know, it's like we ha live in a townhouse in downtown yeah. Philadelphia. So it's yeah, it's rough. And so thinking about that and the freedom of that and also the, you know, there's it's putting them in a different, almost in a different time period in a sense, you know, even though you have phones, you have some electricity, it's not right. like you have nothing, you have cars and stuff like that. But it's like, 
you don't have running water, uh, electricity, indoor toilets, and the right. kids deal. My kids yeah. would flip their <laughs> lids. I didn't start them early enough on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's They've the been trick. going since before they knew any better. So they didn't, yeah. they didn't know to protest. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. funny thing is, you know, in order to get to Alaska, we have to take um, three jets and then one, one bush plane. And really the trip is like 24 hours long. Or longer. Um, or or longer. longer sometimes. And literally when we take a flight that is like less than five hours long, the kids are like, wait a minute. Like I thought we that? were going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought we were going on a trip. This is just like a couple hours mm. on a plane. I don't understand. Mm. So yeah. yeah, they've just been, you know, they've been doing it since they were born. So it makes it a lot easier to throw stuff at them that's unexpected. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that sounds, that just, I mean, I, 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 it's, it does, it sounds magical. It sounds amazing and filthy and disgusting. Yeah, oh, yes. it's oh, all yeah. of those things, all of those <laughs> things. <laughs> all right, I wanna make sure we have a few minutes for sure. questions if we have any, um, yeah. and, but before we get into that, um, where can people find you? Where the, where is the best place to find you? And um, and I think you you know you're raising money for this trip. Is there some place you can send people to? Continue? So so if people are interested in that, follow us, and then they will be informed when it's time. We're sort of in the quiet phase of fundraising right now. If people want to send us money, go for it. You like can big chunks of money, um, we're all we're, we can figure that we can figure out a way to do that. Instagram is the best place to follow us. Robbie dot and dot Matthew, but Robbie doesn't have an e. R O B B I dot a n d matthew website robbie and matthew youtube robbie and matthew so those are the three we, we do a video every day every day a 60 minute video called the daily minute 60 second 60 second video 60 second <laughs> video i want it to be a full hour um we, i don't know I, I i shouldn't describe the daily minute because i'm i'm of the daily minute but for for a minute every day we opine or report on something or other usually not of much substance but if that, if you like this thing we've got going, check it out on Instagram, right? And uh, yeah, and we'll we'll be if you want to follow in the longer term, we'll take you all around the country with us in a year or two. So that's yeah, that's, yeah. That's, I think that's or, I think we should. I think we should definitely all follow <laughs> that. the The daily minute is something I didn't bring up specifically, but it is. It's I I love that. So this is a you've been doing this for several years now, right? Is it every day? Every, every day, day. Um, for the seconds. past three years at least. If, yeah. A friend of ours told us to do it. A friend of ours who we're, we respect. We well, we you were always doing, do what your friends tell you to do. Yeah. We well, this, doing, this, you, with this, this lady tells you to do, listen. you do. You do yeah. what she yeah. says. Yeah. Um, no, at the time we were doing live streams on Facebook that were super fun. We were having a good time. Like just in our studio, Matthew sometimes would do Matthew Draws, which is this goofy thing where Matthew draws celebrities and he's not a great drawer. So it was like people would have to guess who he was drawing. Oh, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> so, um, so we were doing all this goofy stuff, live streaming. And this woman said, I love you guys, but like an hour is too, like it's too long. I don't want to sit there. Okay. Like one minute, one minute of you guys day. every day. So, yeah. so yeah. So but have you literally how... done it every day? Mm -hmm. You've hit three days in the last three oh, years. Oh, yeah. You just forgot. Yeah. Wow. You wow. Have missed it a long that is amazing. Time. But it's also, this is constraint, right? This is also, it's yeah. like constrained marketing. Mm -hmm. yep. So, mm -hmm. you know, having a rule, like it has to be 60 seconds. There's a countdown yeah. clock. Um, do you re-record if necessary? Only if Matthew says something offensive accidentally. Um, <laughs> occasionally, we need, the, we need the content to be kid-friendly because librarians follow us and we want to be, our, our books are for elementary school kids. So we want it to be accessible to them, even if they don't always understand it. So we re-record if we say something untoward. Otherwise, we have a one-take policy. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we do have one question from Shelly, okay. um, who asks, how much do you believe in fate or coincidences playing a part in your journey? Whoa. Okay. So Shelly, um, I am a creature of habit. Every single day when I lived in Massachusetts, I would go running in the afternoon and I would run on one side, the beautiful side of this building in the town where I lived. One day, for whatever reason, I ran through the parking lot side of the building by the dumpsters. And right there by the dumpsters, I found Robbie. She was getting out of a car and I ran into her. We'd gone to college together. So we said, hi, how are you? We exchanged email addresses. We wrote emails together uh, every day for a year. And then eventually Robbie came to visit and that was that. 
That was the only time I ever ran that way. That seems like fate slash coincidence to me. That was something that was Robbie's magnetic aura drawing me into the madness. I don't know. What's your answer, Robbie? I think absolutely. I I mean, yes, I do. I do. I I don't know if if I don't know if I would call it fate, but absolutely coincidence. Um, and yeah, I think some things just happen, and the, there's not anything that we did to make them happen, and they are a gift from the universe to us. Like it's corny as that sounds. Like I do think that a lot of things happen that have benefited me and us that just happened. Some really crazy, wonderful yeah. things have yeah. happened to us that yeah. yes, we can say we made our own luck, but we made our own luck on a foundation of such fortune and privilege that yeah. we both feel like we have to make the most of it. And meeting each other and being made so much more capable because of each other, I feel I'm even more in need to, to do good and make beautiful things and interesting things as a result of that. So hope that was an answer, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I think yeah. that's, yeah. What more can you say, you know? Of yeah. course, like, of course there's there's making your own luck, there's privilege, there's all those things that go into it. And then you have to, you know, take what comes and things can come that are good, things can come that are bad and yeah. roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It is yeah. a pleasure and an mm. honor to hang out with thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank um, you, yeah. And thank you audience members for coming. Uh, we will be back with the Autonomous Creative in uh, February, I believe. We're working on some great people coming up. We have not scheduled dates yet, but I think we're going to have Hannah Tinty, of the author and the yeah founder of One. We love Hannah, her. Please. Yes, she's she's yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. Nice. Wendy McNaughton, illustrator at Wendy ah. McNaughton, is going to be coming, and um, I think a couple. Of, I have another people. Other people I'm working on. Hasn't played out yet, so I'm not going to announce. <laughs> Neither of them are scheduled, but it's coming. So pay attention to the emails that come your way, and I hope you'll be here when that comes up. Um, you can follow us on Crowdcast. There's a My name is up at the top of the screen here. If you hit that, you can get to our channel. You can follow our channel, and you'll get notifications when we go live. Um, I'm also going to be offering a free new training um, in a few weeks. Again, if you follow us on, on Crowdcast, you will find out about that as well. So thanks for everybody for coming. Thank you, Matthew, Robbie. It has been a pleasure. Ours as well. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, and thanks thank everybody you. for joining us. Bye friends. <laughs>